Okay, so let's go. To do MVC is one of the most common example when it comes to the JavaScript frameworks. Every single new one has their own implementation of it. While being very good at showing all possible use cases and features of modern applications, it's not so good for to show to non to non technical person. We can expect that it would be a great thing to show this to the person and say, hey, why don't you learn React or Ember so you can create a new to-do list app? Because I guess person would tell us, hey, I already have uh, uh, reminders. And I think the same situation is happening with artificial intelligence. Uh, if you look into the artificial intelligence or machine learning examples, we mostly find examples like finding of the cat faces, which is really amazing, but I really don't think you want to find all of the images of the cats on the internet because you can just download the whole internet at once. Uh, same for the handwritten digit recognition in JavaScript. It's a really good example, but I don't think you would need that unless you are a post office or you're working very, very often with uh, handwritten uh, numbers. The best examples I could, uh, I could found is sketch to an image. It shows us that the neural networks and machine learning allows us ability to give to the machines to be creative, the thing which is highly associated with human beings and not with the machines. Today I'm going to talk about machine learning education. Uh, my name is Michał Koźmiński, I'm a software engineer at Clara. Actually, it's not machine learning education, it should be more like how to improve learning foreign language with machine learning techniques, but I really want you guys to come here, so that was, that was like a clickbait. Uh, first, when we start, I want to talk about machine learning so we're all on the same page and we go to the examples. When we talk about machine learning, usually we talk about artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is technologies that allow us to perform specific tasks as well as or better as a human beings, but mostly we focus on the narrow or a weak AI, which is doing just one thing. It's not a intelligent as we think as a human being, but it's doing just one thing. Good example could be Siri or image classification. It's good at one thing, but you wouldn't be friend with Siri. Uh, and IE could be thought by programmers with algorithms. It doesn't have to know everything by himself. So if you write a very, very good if statement, it could be, it could be said it's, it's an AI. AI. Other thing is machine learning. It's a sub-district of the artificial intelligence. And machine learning is a little different because here we don't create algorithms to solve problems, but we create algorithms which will get the knowledge from the data passed to the uh, algorithm and then learn from it. So instead of hard uh, coding the detection of the uh, letters or anything, we create an algorithm which will detect edges and then based on that, we'll learn how to detect uh, letters. The good example could be uh, computer vision, which, would be which was very successful with machine learning, and that's why it became so popular. And the last thing is deep learning. Uh, it's an approach for artificial neural networks, and they were known for the decades. Base algorithm, which is base propagation, was published in 1986. Neural networks came to existence by understanding how cells in our brain work and how the interconnection between neurons work. But unlike biological brain, the neural networks are stuck into the layers. So they are not connected based on the distance, but based on the layers. Another thing is that in the case of deep learning, we know where da data is flowing through. So we know where is the input, where is the output, where is not known in case of biological uh, cells. And the only recent development caused mm, neural networks to be very, very successful. Because neural networks are, were not good for usage since they needed a lot of computation power. And only in recent GPU power and CPU power allow us to use it. When we talk about uh, machine learning, we also have to distinguish two things, supervised and unsupervised learning. Long story short, supervised learning is when we get an input and we already know the output and we're trying to find the map function. So we have a two arrays and we try to find how to map one array to another. So when we create a new input, we will understand how to classify it. So example would be on the right, 
where we know which one is the stars, which one is the circles, and we just have to find the classifier or so where the line will be, which will be separating them. Other thing is unsupervised learning. It's when we try to discover inherent grouping of the data. Let's say we have a users on our website, and we have to want to understand how they use it. So now, we, now, based on the data, we can group our users into some groups, which might be super users, users which will use our application really, and discover other abilities and how to fit more to the, to the needs of our users. Talking about machine learning, we cannot forget about one most important thing. I mean, like, maybe it's not the most important, but most common thing, is the Irish dataset from Ronald Fisher. Uh, the data set is from 1936 and was created by Ronald Fisher, who was a biologist and statistician. He was one, one of the first persons who started using statistician methods for uh, classifying the types of uh, flowers in this case. Uh, he used sepal and petal len length and width to classify different types. As we can see on this graph, we see three different types of uh, irises. It's quite easy to distinguish to uh, one type from two others, where we just have data about sepal width and sepal length. And we do it with just normal uh, classification, which will be linear function. But the situation begins to be tricky when we try to do this for two other species. Even if we get all of the four uh, possible values, we still end up with very messy polynomial uh, separation which is not good. We can try to come up with it, but as I said, we have a really nice tool, which is neural networks. And they are known for classifying problems, which are very hard and complex model. So as we can see in this example, I just hope it's going to work. This is an example from TensorFlow uh, Playgrounds. Uh, that's a neural network running in real time, trying to classify the spiral uh, data. As we can see, it will take some time uh, until neurons develop some idea how the data are uh, pl uh, planned on the, on the plot. But with some time and some corrections, we see that the model becomes to be stable. And in this case, it took 300, oh, a little bit more, I guess. So it took about 500 uh, repetitions to create a model which is stable. And as we can see, the neural networks are really good at processing data which are very highly dimensional. So that's why it worked really well with um, our recognition of images. Uh, as we can see here, in the input, we have an image which is 512 by 512 uh, pixels which means that we are now operating into 512 by 512 dimensions, which is impossible for us to even imagine. But for neural, neural network, it's not a problem. And using the power of neural network, we can classify these images. One of the reasons, as I said, was develop of the GPUs and better CPUs. So here we can see the example from 1998, where we use 10 million pixels to train the network. And even not 20 years later, we use 10 million times more data to feed our network. So in the next 20 years, we can probably use 10 million times more even data then. But let's go back to the JavaScript. Why I think machine learning is now important to JavaScript? One of the things is web workers. And probably you can listen about it a little bit more tomorrow from Jan Eric, but I will just briefly tell you that this allows us to have a native performance in the browser, so we can perform algorithms in almost the same speed as C or C++ will do it. Other thing, which is really exciting, is WebGL or WebGPU. On the left, we can see how the data would be processed in the single-threaded system, where you have a CPU, we copy data from the, from the memory, we put the CPU, and CPU gives us output back to the memory. It has to iterate over each value, where when we look at the GPU, the process looks a little bit differently. GPUs were created to process uh, textures. And texture is nothing more but pixels, which are 32 bits uh, integers. And it's really good, because now, instead of pixels and images, we can just put our data there, process it with the GPU with multiple thousands of the processes at once, and get the output uh, from, uh, from our data sets, which is really handful for uh, machine learning applications, but it's also uh, really fast. So let's talk about applications. So what we can do with this power uh, in JavaScript. 
when we want to learn languages. As I told before, uh, I'm going to tell about how to improve uh, learning foreign language uh, with machine learning. Mm. And what is the best way to learn a foreign language? I, I guess it's moving to the country which is speaking this natively, but not always you have this opportunity. Sometimes you want to learn, in my case it was Spanish. Uh, I was learning Spanish and I was living in Berlin, so not the best, f not, not the best uh, choice. But we still have a lot of data and a lot of videos and, mus in, and podcasts on the internet, so why not to use it? So I tried to create the application for learning for, uh, foreign languages using already existing resources. I wanted to not create a new content and automate most of the tasks. And what is the best place to find all of the videos and podcasts? I think it's YouTube. YouTube offers us Data API, which gives us brief information about video. And using this data, I try to extract all of the videos which I would need to my purpose uh, to, to watch it. So I set up the crawler, which was going through the data and getting all of the videos, which only had closed captions in Spanish and English. And the title suggested that it was Spanish version and it was popular in the uh, Spanish speaking countries. But I ended up with 62% correctly classified videos. So I still was missing 38% of the videos, which were not Spanish videos, but were on different language which, or were not interesting for me. So uh, I have to s somehow solve it, or I have to clean every third video by myself. So I came up that I will do sound analyzer. And this went up to 95% of correctly classified videos. But how sound analyzer works and how we can do it. So if we look into the wave, this is the analog wave of the, from the speech. Uh, how, does we s how, does, how do we put it into the machine learning? We have to look closely into the wave. Let's look closer. If you look closer into the wave, the vertical lines are sampling rate. So each time the machine tries to get the amplitude of the wave. Then amplitude is changed to the integer representation, which will be looking more like that. Uh, but we don't save it as a graphic thing, but we save it as a vector and an array. So we end up with the numbers. And that's really good, because numbers are understandable by machines. Analog wave, not so much. Other thing which we needed is a sliding window. It's the same story as when you're in airport waiting for your baggage and there is a belt coming. If I ask you to close your, window, uh, close your eyes for every single five seconds, just look in front of you, there's a, some chance that the bag will firstly show up on your right and then on your left and you will never see it. So what we do is we take five second sample and move it just by one second. So if we take the first sample, second sample, we have a one second offset, still containing four seconds of the old sample, which makes sure that our algorithm will have a chance to understand what is the specific of the language. And we end up with the three vectors, which then we put to the algorithm, and we're feeding this data to the um, deep neural network, and as an output, we get a percentage of how possible is this language is going to be classified. But still, it's not JavaScript. So what we can do with JavaScript? There is something called WebDNN, and it's really amazing because it allows us converting models from Cafe or TensorFlow into the JavaScript functions. So what we can do is we can compile everything to JavaScript and then deploy it to Azure Functions or AWS Lambda and have classification as a service, or have a classification on a browser, which I would now try to show. Okay, that's microphone. Okay, as we can see, this is the sound wave represented on the uh, binary. Uh, and now let's see, is our netw neural network going to detect language which is spoken? So I'm going to ask you to not talk for like two minutes because this algorithm was, wasn't trained with the noise in the back. So I, don't ha I have no idea what's going to happen if there's going to be some noise in the background. So let's initialize it. So when I speak, start speaking English, network exact 
uh, markers which activate certain neurons. These neurons are linked with output classifying English. When it's Deutsch beginning to sprechen, we does not nicht durch die Eigenschaften der englischen Sprache aktiviert und under das Status. Kiedy zacznę mówić po polsku, sieć ponownie zmieni aktywację, jak i swój wynik, co możemy obserwować właśnie na ekranie. I jest to możliwe tylko w zwykłej przeglądarce. That's it, that's the whole example I wanted to show. It worked, I was really, I was really scared. <laughs> There is no integration test for that. Okay, let's go next. Uh, but we talk about neural networks, but I think a lot of problems could be solved with really uh, simple algorithms. If you don't believe me, there is a tweet. It has 1,000 retweets, so I guess it's right. You really can believe it. Uh, so let's get the data. To get the data, we need to get a user into the loop. So we start with something which is called online learning, where we don't process all of the data at once, but we start with the batches. We get the users who generate more data. This data are used to tune our model, and then tuning this model gathers more users because we have more accurate model. And as I said, I had an example where you could watch videos with both subtitles, English and Spanish. In this example, uh, we have a video which has a both subtitles, but there is another option where we can just see it with the Spanish subtitles, and we have an English Uh, captions only when we select a uh, word which we don't know. And now we can gather this information from the users and see what words they didn't understood and how we can suit videos better to them. So first we have to start with understanding our model, which is called feature extraction. When you start with every single machine learning problem, we have to extract the features. And in our case, it could be length, character use, how similar the word is with the language you know, so in this case it would be English, how many times it occurs, how common is the word generally, so occurrences is the occurrences in the one video or our database, and how common the word would be, much wider uh, aspect of it, and what form is it in case if it's a verb. Because we cannot just put pure words into the, our model, we need to extract some data from it. And key to the understanding would be visualization. Uh, I have some demo here which I can show you. Let me just close it. Ah. Another one. Okay, that's our data. So as we can see, we can quite easily we can quite easily see that for example easy words are not very similar to the English words, also are not very complex, but are highly, uh, have highly occurrence. So here, we can see that in this case, we can easily separate using, uh, finding the easy words with one simple linear classification. The problem begins when we try to extract the medium or the hard words because there is not much data where we can see that very different. Only, thing I, only place I could find it was here, where you can see that the only hard word uh, exists. But still, you can try to find your model and improve it, and the most uh, exciting thing about it is that the more you understand your model, the more you also understand your users. Other feature which we can try to extract is user skipping video. As, I, as, you, as you remember, uh, back in the, I was speaking, we have 95 correctly classified videos, which means that we end up with 4-5% of wrongly classified videos, which are not suited for the users who would be listening to this. Uh, and what we could do here is gather all of the possible data from how users behave on the website. So user, uh, people have a tendency to really easily being distracted. So as video progress, and it's not interesting for, the, for someone, he will start to go through it faster or even close it. And as we gather these informations, we can improve our model and f get rid of the 5% wrongly uh, classified videos. And what would be the possible improvements here, I guess? Uh, 
I think we could try getting more data from uh, metadata, uh, from data API. And I think that we could also work on something which is called Brain.js on client side to find videos which would be interesting for other people, uh, or watch you based on what you watched before. Uh, and as a last sentence, I leave you with this quote by Robert Browning, less is more. You always try to find the easiest possible model, even if it's more inaccurate than complex model, it will be much easier to tune your model, which is simple and easy, than a model which will be highly complex. That's it, thank you. All of the resources are here, so if you want to uh, look into it, go ahead. Thank you very much.